You need not say goodbye. The people will shout my name. Pilate will tell them there's nothing I've done to deserve this, but they will refuse. Pilate will stand me beside Barabbas, a murderer, and they will choose him over me. Pilate will appeal to the priest, insist on simply whipping me to appease their fury, but they will shout it louder, crucify, crucify. But still, you need not say goodbye. My hands will be tied to a post. The sound of the whip will ring in your ears and in your chest. The soldiers will peel the skin off my back. A ring of thorny branches will be pressed into my scalp until the blood runs into my eyes. Oh, but listen. You need not say goodbye. I will carry that cross. I will go to the place of the skull, and there they will drive the iron stakes between the bones in my wrist. With a hammer, they will nail my feet into the tree. I will be raised up as the world waits for me to die. Nevertheless, you need not say goodbye. Between two thieves, I will hang. You may hear me speaking to my father your father. You may hear me ask him, why? But child, you need not say goodbye. What you won't see, what you won't hear, what you won't know until all of this is done is that in that moment, I was paying the penalty of your wrongdoing, every wrongdoing, every mistake, Every act of envy, every word of hatred, every moment of violence and greed and spite, every selfish desire, every lustful thought, every moment of weakness and weariness, all the failures of human history will be in my hands and on my head. On that cross, I will suffer the wrath that was destined for you. Every guilty verdict fallen on me, your punishment will be paid for in my blood and it will be enough. I will die on your cross. I will let out a final sigh. Know that I have loved you, and you need not say goodbye. But if you must, if you absolutely must say the word goodbye, then say it like this. Goodbye fear. Goodbye sorrow. Goodbye rejection. Goodbye shame. Say it like this. Goodbye guilt. Goodbye condemnation. Goodbye all the regrets of the past. Look up at the cross and speak the words. Goodbye addiction. Goodbye chains. Goodbye hopelessness. Right here in this place, say it aloud. Goodbye captivity. Hello freedom. Goodbye loneliness. Hello belonging. Goodbye defeat. Hello victory. This is the end of the curse. This is the demise of the serpent. This is all debts paid. This is, it is finished. Goodbye all the powers of hell. Goodbye darkness. Goodbye dread. Goodbye every sin. Go ahead and say it. Goodbye death. Speak and be free, but don't say goodbye to me. Yes, you'll see them put the spear in my side, but remember, it's only Friday, so you need not say goodbye.
Good morning, Ellerslie. Good morning. I know some of us are fighting on our hearts this morning saying, I know I'm supposed to believe it, but really, what's good about this morning? Our tendency is to be drawn into living between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, to hanging on to, living in fear of, succumbing to the deathy parts of life. Everything we see and feel makes us look down, look out, look in. But today, today calls us to look up. On the third day, he rose again, exactly like he said he would. Yes, life is a fight, but Jesus is ahead of you and fighting for you. This, the peak event of all of history, of all of the universe, validates the promise God made to his people as he called them out of slavery to journey with him. The Lord, your God, who is going before you, will fight for you. Yes, it's a war zone. Life is a war zone. But in that war zone, in Jesus, we can discover a love that wins. This morning, let's open our heart to letting that love win for us and in us again. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that in spite of what we see when we look out at the things happening around us, when we look down at the things we have counted on to move forward on, and as we look inside at the battles we fight in our hearts and so often lose in our attitudes and feelings, thank you that because of what happened in history, in our world that we celebrate today, that in you, every battle is a winning battle. Grab our hearts, Lord, again today with that truth so we can see that even this morning is a good morning because we stand before you in the name, the power, the glory of the risen Jesus. Amen. Peace, bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, I'll let it break at your name. Jesus, Jesus. 
Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus has been raised from the dead. Amen? My wife Jenna and I have been engaged while sitting on our couch as best as we can, and we are all in talking back to the TV from time to time. Now, to be fair, this isn't completely unusual for me. As a big sports fan, if the Oilers are playing, if my favorite basketball or football team are playing, I'm regularly yelling or saying encouragement to my favorite players. So it's a fairly normal thing, but that's a story for another time. For now... Let's focus on the verse that we've been reflecting on this weekend. It comes from Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 30. The Lord your God, who is going before you, will fight for you. Before I came to Ellerslie, I was at a small rural church about 45 minutes west of the city, and we liked to throw a party. Any excuse we could come up with, we were going to have a party. Someone turned 50, let's party. Our missionary partners were giving an update. Let's party. Bruce and Kathy's four growing kids have come back from all over the country. Let's have a party. But of all the events we put together, our biggest party was something called the Fall Feast. With about half of our church being farmers, we'd talk to them each fall, usually late September, and we'd say, when do you think harvest will be done this year? Because we want to celebrate and throw a big party. Our little church, we averaged about 60 people, and if you're thinking that small, well, I'm preaching to nobody in the auditorium right now, so it was a lot bigger than what I'm staring at right now, would more than triple in size. It wasn't unusual for the fall feast to have 200 people at the event. We would invite our friends, we would invite family, we'd invite neighbors, we invited the local seniors group, we invited the youth, everybody. It was a great time to party and to celebrate the harvest. The church budget would cover about 75 pounds of turkey and ham. The church family would bring all the fixings, the mashed potatoes, the cranberry sauce, the homemade stuffing, delicious salads, pumpkin pie, cookies, brownies, food as far as the eye could see. What does this have to do with Easter? The Apostle Paul, who wrote a number of letters to different churches after the death of Jesus, spends an entire chapter talking about the richness, the beauty the glory of Jesus' resurrection. And in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, he compares it to the harvest, reminding us that there is something greater to come. This is what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 and 22. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Jesus himself is going before us, and that gives us reason to celebrate. After the Israelites had escaped from Egypt, but before they got to the promised land, Moses stood before the Israelites on a number of occasions and would say to them, brothers and sisters, when we arrive in the promised land, when we plant our own crops, and right before we reap the harvest, we're going to take the first fruits and present them to God and to the priests remembering that there is something greater to come. The first fruits was a sample of the very best the crop had to offer and would indicate the nature and the quality of the harvest to come. This became such an important part of the Jewish ethos, the Jewish culture, that the festival of first fruits was born. By faith, at the beginning of the harvest, a Jewish farmer would take the first part of his crop and dedicate it to God, believing his crop had been consecrated, set apart, and that something better was to come. After journeying through the wilderness, when Israel arrived in Canaan, they were to give their first fruits to God. And after journeying through the wilderness, when Jesus arrives in glory, he gives us the very best of himself, a taste of what's to come. It is in this resurrection of Jesus that we see the fulfillment of the First Fruits Festival, his resurrected body, perfect, whole, complete, immune to sickness and disease, will never wear out, will never gain the quarantine 15 and remind us of a better day that is to come. It's Jesus himself who goes before us and one day our perfect bodies will follow. 
his resurrected body, a taste of the future. That's our reason to celebrate, knowing that it's Jesus who goes before us and the best is yet to come. The second half of our passage is verses 23 and 24, and this is what it says. But each in his own turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. Do you see the progression that takes place in these verses? It starts with Jesus, then all those who believe in him, and then the captives. This is a picture of something called the Roman triumph. It sounds impressive, doesn't it? The first recorded Roman triumph was believed to be held in 20 BC, where the conquering republic came back to Rome in all its pomp and circumstance. It was first Caesar, then his army, then the vanquished foe. It looked as something like this. The triumph began with Caesar, seated on an elevated throne, uh, being pulled by four different horses. Behind him, the incredible strength of the Roman army, with breastplates gleaming in the sun, looking strong and powerful as a parade of people watched and cheered them on. Behind them, the vanquished foes no longer wearing their armor, but rather dressed in rags with heads bound down, often chained up, walking in absolute defeat. Over the course of time, the Roman triumph added even more pomp and pageantry with speeches, meals, banners, and music besides, but it always included Caesar, the army, and the captives. At the time that Paul was writing to the church in Corinth, this would have been a commonplace picture and an image that his listeners readily understood. So allow me to bring another piece of context into that picture. Do you know who the Caesar was back at that time? It was the same Caesar who asked Mary and Joseph to go to the town of Bethlehem. It was the same Caesar who was in power during the time of Jesus' birth. And what's so amazing is that Caesar Augustus could have never imagined that while he was trying to show the world how strong and powerful he was, Jesus Christ, the ruler's true and rightful king, was about to show the world how great and powerful he is. As great as the Roman triumph has been and looks, a greater triumph is coming. The return of our right, powerful, and glorious king, who will be whole, perfect, complete, never again subject to weakness or illness, suffering or pain, aging or death, leading us into glory in our resurrected bodies. This is the king who in the midst of the battle goes before us, the king who in the midst of the battle will fight for us. And I have to ask the question, what would it look like if we believed this was reality? I invite you to listen to Michael's story as he's in the middle of living out what it means to believe that Jesus is going before him. Over the last six years, I've found myself uh, challenged. Um, I watched some of the uh, things unfold in the company I was with um, that kind of challenged my morals and, and my convictions personally. I was, having, I was having some internal struggles, some issues internally. Um, it was noticing some things and noticing the effects that it had on the people around me that I brought into the company that, that really kind of tore me apart. The company wasn't a bad company. They just kind of, it was some bad situations and some bad decisions that were made. Um, I was struggling with those internally, so I prayed. Uh, I prayed, I, I was reading about Gideon, and, and, I, and I prayed like Gideon, I asked God for a clear sign. Uh, anyway, I was, I was smacked in the face with the sign that I was looking for, um, and, I, and I had to make a decision, so I, I wrote my re- letter of resignation to the company, and uh, I struggled with it for a couple days. I wrote it, and, and that, that's been my challenge, that's been my, um, that's, that's been my hurdle. Uh, I prayed a lot. I, I've asked God to uh, to lead me through the things, the decisions that I've been making. Um, I applied for a couple companies. I, I I really didn't start having interviews until after my resignation was was in, and I I, I stood my ground. Um, 
I asked God for a, a clear sign between the three companies that I was that I was uh, looking at getting in with. Um, God closed the doors at two of the companies, and the third company said they wanted me, and they said uh, the third interview that I was going in for was merely a formality. And that was that. That conversation was the day before this COVID thing really broke into high gear in uh, North America. So anyway, they put a freeze on uh, on hiring, and they weren't they weren't going to hire anybody else. Uh, they were actually doing layoffs, and so they had said that if I was to be hired, uh, I would it would be bad optics in the office. So I've actually watched God in His timing through all of this. Um, reveal things to me and allow me certain opportunities that I don't think would have been there if God wasn't directing me and, and, and opening doors and, and giving me opportunities. Um, I strongly believe that God's been in control of all of this and he's, he's given me opportunities to prove my tenacity and, and prove my um, dedication and prove my loyalty and, and prove all of those characteristics that I have to the company that I'm trying to get in with. And it's strengthened the relationship that I have with subcontractors and with clients. And it's actually built a lot of, um, it's, it's shown people a lot of character uh, that I have and, and that I'm willing to stand behind the convictions that I have. So it's actually strengthened my relationships with people. Um, it's It's helped in it's helped in proving to the company that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get in with right now that, that uh, I, do, I do have the character that I say that I have and, and the dedication that I say that I have. So it, it's been good. I've had an overwhelming uh, sense of peace through this uh, whole experience. Um, the, my, my wife, Ashley, uh, and my kids, I mean, every, everyone is very calm through this time of unemployment and watching God direct our lives. So uh, I, I don't think that I would have this sense of calm and this sense of peace uh, without God driving the ship, uh, without God directing me right now. Salvation in your name, Jesus 
Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your burning body began to break. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your burning body began to breathe was the man chosen by God to lead the expansion of the church from its Jewish cradle centered in Jerusalem to be a world-embracing, culture-transcending, history-shaping movement. Paul was probably the least likely candidate for that role. As a rising leader in Judaism after Jesus left the scene, he was doing everything he could to squash the influence of Jesus. Paul had every reason to not want to believe And yet, he could not deny the evidence. He could not help but being impressed with the power and conviction in the lives of those who did believe. And he could not resist the personal encounter he had with the risen Jesus. And when he accepted that, it all came together. Some of us listening here today might be on the the approach side of that hurdle. Wondering whether we can really believe that Jesus rose from the dead. This week, we are starting an Alpha course online to help you explore some of those questions. Check it out at erbc.ca slash alpha. So Paul led in establishing churches all across the Roman Empire, and he wrote most or a, a more of the New Testament than any other writer. And the last book Paul wrote was to a young pastor as he was in chains in a Roman prison Paul was in change, knowing he would probably be executed as a power play to squash the Jesus movement. Timothy was definitely not ready for Paul to be gone. He struggled with fear, with insecurity, knowing he was not the apostle and needing the foundational support of Paul. And in this letter to Timothy, Paul reminds him of the core things he needs to know. He writes things like, he starts his letter off by saying that God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control, control control of your thinking. 
But he knows that Timothy won't always feel that. And then he says this, the core of what Timothy needs to remember. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Yes, I know that's the message that got me here where I am, chained up like a criminal, but because we know that Jesus rose from the dead, we know that the word, the truth, the hope, the love of what God did for us in Jesus for everyone cannot be chained. So Timothy, go for it. You can't stop the spread of it around the world and you can't stop the power of it in your own life. The one thing we need to tell our hearts when life becomes a battle and it feels like a losing battle is remember Jesus risen from the dead. Why is the resurrection of Jesus the one thing? Well, let's go back to that resurrection chapter that Dave referred us to earlier, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, one of Paul's letters. The chapter that says the good news is simply this, Jesus died just like the scriptures have said he would. Jesus rose again three days later just like it was promised in the scriptures. That's all we need to know in the battle zones of life. He is the one who has gone before us, as, as they said, as the first fruits. He is the one who in the resurrection has fought and won the greatest battle and every battle that comes to us. He's the leading general in this parade, and we are in the parade. And at the end of the chapter, Paul makes this promise that when the parade is over, when Jesus comes to wrap it all up, what we will experience is the ultimate truth of the resurrection, that death has been swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? You have lost. Oh, grave, where is your sting? It's been defeated. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us, gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He not only goes before us, he has fought and won the ultimate battle against us. He has fought and has won the battle on three major fronts. Let's just review those really quickly. Number one, in his resurrection, Jesus won the battle against the real enemy of our souls, the one who sucked us into this mess, the one who we live under as human beings because we got sick, sucked in by him, the evil one, Satan. 1 John chapter 3 says this, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy, to neutralize the work of the evil one. In 1 Peter, he says, you are rescued through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him. So the one thing we need to know, as John says in 1 John chapter 4, he who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Number two, he has won the victory over the sin which I was born into and born with an inherited condition of my heart. It was religious Paul who was a model of human goodness according to the law of God that he thought he was to live by, at least so he thought, but when Paul met Jesus, he began to see his own heart in a different way. And he began to realize the way he'd been living in denial and trying to prove himself. And it actually led him into this funk, a deep funk. He describes it in Romans chapter 7, which ends with this huge statement of, well, it almost sounds like defeat. Wretched man that I am, he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? But it's not true defeat. He can only admit the depth of his struggle in his heart because of what he has come to live in. The next line, he says, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I have won. He has defeated the penalty of my sin. By his Spirit in me, I can have victory over the power of my sin. And because Jesus has gone ahead of me, one day I will overcome the presence of any sin in my heart. Number three, in Jesus' resurrection, he has fought and has won the one thing that came into the world as a result of human sin, death. 
death itself. In Jesus' literal, physical, bodily resurrection from the dead, Jesus has won it all. Not just physical death, but the ultimate death, separation from the presence of God. And that's where he ends this chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Just listen to the words of Paul. So it will be with the resurrection from the dead, the body that is sown perishable is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, but it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. It is sown when we were born a natural body, but it is raised a body with spiritual life. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. And then later on, he says, for the per perishable at that day, when Jesus comes to raise us into him fully and finally, for the perishable will clothe itself with the imperishable, the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Because of Jesus' re resurrection, as someone once said, the grave is simply a flower pot out of which a beautiful Easter lily will bloom. There is no ba major battlefront in this world over which the resurrection of Jesus Christ has not already guaranteed victory. And so, two questions. Number one, have I accepted the love and submitted to the leadership of Jesus in the battles of my life? You see, he only wins for me if I have allowed him to claim me, all of me. Have you allowed Jesus to claim you for himself? Number two, am I allowing that victory to define me? To define what I think about, what I see in everything that comes at me in life? I was powerfully touched this week by a telephone call that LaDonna made to one of our dear Ellerslie women who knows that she will soon be losing her long-fought long physical battle with cancer. A battle that has caused her to lose a lot more than just physical health. She's a woman whose lifeline the last five years has been to be with God's people in church on Sunday at Ellerslie. Now she's isolated at home able to have physical contact with only a very few family members. And so LaDonna gave her a call this week. She was so thankful for the call and appreciative of what she had. And then in talking about her big sadness at not being able to come to church, she said in a tone of voice that LaDonna said was almost cheery, filled with, filled with hope. She said, this Sunday is Easter Sunday, and it's my birthday and knowing her, when LaDonna told me that I, that, I couldn't help but ask myself, oh dear, oh dear, what if, what if? She is living to the end in light of the truth of the song that we heard earlier. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, a roaring lion declared, the grave has no grip on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. That truth is not invalidated by the battles of life. It is the validation that my battle does not have to define me nor determine how I see today. I have also been moved as I had the privilege of journeying the last two years with someone who is giving herself to live in daily life in the victory of Jesus' resurrection life, even though at many times for her life, is a battle. Let's listen to Tina as she tells her story. Hey, Ellerslie family, I'm Tina. So since I was about 18, I've suffered from obsessive compulsive disorder. It pretty much ran my life. It's irrational, it leads to a complete lack of peace, and that was really missing from my life until Jesus found me. Driving home with a friend one day, I told her my brain just never stops. I can't stop thinking. She looked at me bewildered and laughing. Well, I, I often think of nothing. 
It may seem weird for somebody who doesn't have OCD to think nothing could mean so much. I would be driving and I'd be bombarded with thoughts, doing dishes, laying in bed. My mind would never just turn off. I would have a conversation with someone and try focusing on them while battling so many unwanted thoughts also coming into my head. There was so much frustration, worry, and fear. I remember when I first believed the Bible was the truth and the amount of zeal I had to learn about God. I would sleep four hours a night because I wanted to read the whole Bible. I realized that part of this was my OCD and the obsessive part of my brain, but I wanted to know everything as soon as possible. I remember after hearing about Jesus and what he did for me, having these unbelievable moments of peace that I've never felt before. Jesus didn't heal my OCD in an instant. It has been a journey. In the beginning, I had moments of terrible OCD that attached to my face since that's what OCD does. It attaches itself to what you care about most. Since no one else in my family was a believer, I really wanted a home church and a sense of true community. So I prayed for a church and God led me to Ellerslie. One day I was having an OCD attack and wanted to talk to another Christian. So I drove to Ellerslie. I knew I was at the right place here. The love of Christ was really shown to me from the first moments I came to Ellerslie. I was never judged and I was made to feel like I belonged. There's one simple moment of God's goodness that always stuck with me. I was having an awful OCD attack in the Mac store. My brain was on fire and I was praying through all these thoughts for God to help me. I was distraught when I left the store, but as soon as I walked out of the very, the very first person I saw was one of my only Christian friends, a girl who I grew up with helped me on my, who helped me on my faith journey. I grabbed onto her and told her everything that was going on. I was so thankful that God put her right there when I needed her. He is such a loving God. Psalm 28, 6, 7. Blessed be the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplications. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoices and I with my song will praise him. I read, this state, I read the statement the other day of how prayer is the bridge between panic and peace. Even though I was having this battle in my mind, I turned to God and he delivered me and brought peace to my storm. I remember praying that God would heal me. This verse would come to me. Verse KGV, 2 Corinthians 12, 8 to 10. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, and the, so the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in my reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. Some of the closest moments I have had with God have been moments that I've been suffering with OCD. Through getting to know God, praying, going to a faith-based counselor, reading his word, attending Ellerslie, and serving, I have been healing. My OCD is minimal, and I'm more able to ignore the thoughts and keep them from consuming me. With everything going on in the world right now, I'm so thankful that I'm able to have peace rather than panic. I won't say I'm never afraid because that's not true. Rather than being consumed by fear though, I am able to turn to Christ and trust in him and be still knowing that he is in control. I know no matter what happens, I have victory in Christ because of the cross. He went before me and has already won the battle. Just like God went before Joshua and brought him and the Israelites into the promised land, I know he has gone before me so one day I can spend eternity with him. I know I'm living in Jesus' peace because some days I find myself not thinking anything. 2 Thessalonians 3.16 Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. Folks, I don't know what battle you are in today. Life is a battle. And if we don't see it as a battle, chances are we're asleep at the wheel. But in whatever war zone you are in, you can discover the God who has gone before you and has fought for you and won even the battles that you face today. We don't have to give in to the battle if we are giving in to Jesus. Jesus Christ, our living hope. It's even better than romance in the war zone. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we stand before you today, not first with our failures, our weaknesses, our inadequacies, nor even with our best efforts, our good sides showing, our accomplishments being held up. We stand 
not just before you, but in Jesus Christ before you. We stand in the name and the victory of Jesus, our living, loving, and glorious Lord. Oh God, today claim our hearts again with the power of that truth. Help us to overcome our own minds with the relevance of that truth. That there is no battle that we face that you have not already won for us. And Lord, rather than giving into it, rather than thinking you are just going to automatically remove us from that battle, we give ourselves to fight well this week, to fighting with your strength, with the confidence of your hope, the assurance of your powerful love that will not let us go. We pray today for all of our caregivers. Protect them. Guide them with your unseen hand and strengthen them in every way. We pray for our global mission partners. And today especially we think of the mere homes in Uganda. Protect them, Father, and grant them wisdom and discernment in their leadership. And Lord, as they have plans to come back to Canada this summer, help them to live in confidence and peace and rest of the assurance of your presence with them, regardless of the outcome of that desire. And Father, we give ourselves to remembering that because of Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, we live in an environment of the strength, the encouragement, and the hope of your grace in Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. God, my Savior, has 
this is amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. I hope you've enjoyed our Easter service and are reminded of the God who goes before us, of the God who fights for us. And if you want to join with us in seeing people come to faith and an understanding of how great and glorious our Jesus is, then I invite you to invite others to Alpha. Alpha is a series of interactive and engaging sessions to explore the Christian faith. And if you know someone who would like to learn more about Jesus or would like to explore what that looks like, we invite you to invite them to Alpha. You can do that by checking us out at erbc.ca slash alpha. Another announcement for you is one of the greatest challenges during this time of physical distancing is social interaction. If you would like to join a small group, find out how you can serve, or even be a part of our weekly prayer time, I invite you to connect with the office at office at erbc.ca. Finally, we're so thankful to join um, in our partnership with Sid Coop from Truth Matters, as well as having our own Kelsey Eichelt to support and resource parents in the digital world. We had our first of three sessions this past Thursday. Our next one will be coming up on April 23rd, and we'll tackle that online challenge of pornography. Whether parents, grandparents, or adults looking for resources, if you'd like to join us, please email Kelsey for the login information to that. Finally, thank you for your continued support to our ministry through your financial giving. If you would like to donate online or to set up automatic withdrawal, the easiest way to do this is go to erbc.ca slash give. Of course, if you're symptom-free and would like a little bit of social interaction, you're more than welcome to come by and drop off a check in the office as well. Your faithful giving allows us to continue to provide services like the ones we're doing online, our phone ministry, and encouraging people every way we know how. God bless everyone. Have a wonderful Easter. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My
Hope will arise. Death is defeated. The king is.